hati muda ni. Dah pipa dah. Hmm. Dah. Dah. Hmm. Pipa present sampai dulu. Ya. Binuri apa? No hanis. Hanis. Ah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So my name is Nuri. So I'm a team Origi, and I'll present about the urinary bladder drainage. So. So here it is the content of my presentation. And then, um, okay, catheterization of the urinary bladder, it permits a direct drainage from the urinary bladder. It is an invasive procedure that should only be carried out using a septic technique to um, reduce the contamination, to avoid the contamination of the site. Mm -hmm. And then there are two types of urinary catheters, yeah. which yeah. are intermittent yeah. catheter and also retention in dwelling catheter. The retention or intermittent catheter is the catheter. So for intermittent, uh, it is uh, known as a single-use catheter, which it is um, discarded immediately after use. And then for the retention or indwelling catheter, uh, it is typically uh, used for uh, long-term use. So uh, because it is left into the urinary bladder and then uh, the it will continuously drain the urinary bladder. Catheter can be inserted uh, transurethrally or supraurethrally. So the urethral catheterization is indicated to obtain urine specimen for microscopic and culture for investigation, for example, in urinary tract infection, and then to monitor urine output in a critically ill patient, and then to relieve urinary retention, for example, in a neurological. Pais, can you gambo your Eh, Pais. Memang oh. macam ni. Memang macam tu kan bawa? Haa, ah. dia start-start dia straight oh. tapi last-last dia curly. Dia wavy. Ya, yeah, just to cerita Jepun punya mangga kan? <laughs> ya, minat tu Jepun mangga. Biasa tak lah. minat jadi macam tu? Tak? <laughs> tak lah. Uh, biar, kalau biar panjang dia jadi macam ni lah. Tapi kalau tak, dia tak straight. Mandi lagi. Hmm? Eh, tak mandi lagi? Eh, mandi. Mandi? Ha. Okay, okay. Continue on. <laughs> to relieve coronary retention, for example, in neurologic bladder. So, uh, it is contraindicated if there's any presence of uh, pelvic fracture, neurotrial trauma, or if there's any presence of the blood at the meatus, it may suggest that there is uh, injury towards the uh, urethra. So, equipment needed are... But what? Sorry, doctor. Go backward. Oh, you you me and this one dah. You gambar ni. Hmm. Okay, okay. Okay. Continue. Okay. The equipment needed are the gloves, sterile and non-sterile gloves, sterile drips for sterile uh for the uh field sterilization, and then uh cleansing solution, cotton swipe for sep antiseptic solution. Usually we use uh chlorhexidine. We need to use solution, do not use alcohol because the site, the perineum site especially is very sensitive. So we, we cannot use alcohol. It may 
cause irritation. And then, sterile water to inflate the balloon, catheter to be introduced and then shrink, lubricant to lubricate the um, catheter, collection bag and tube, and the sterile container for specimen collection. So here is the uh, recommended catheter size. The catheter size, it depends on the size of the urethra and in general, the age of the patient. So here is the list of the recommended catheter use. Okay. So before we proceed, uh, this, uh, divided in, into male infant, also female infant. For male infant, the procedure involves the poly catheter, while in female infant, it involves the intermittent catheter. The first thing we must do is to check that we have the correct patient and ensure that we have explained to the procedure to the patient or their parents. A sterile field should be set up next to the patient since the catheter is inserted in the sterile condition possible. Supply should be gathered, and in this case, we should have betadine to provide sterility of the field, the catheter in which you to be inserted, KY jelly as a lubricant to ensure that the catheter easily go through the urinary tract, sterile water to inflate the Foley balloon, and finally some drapes in order to maintain sterility around the area of interest. Procedure first begin with providing uh, drapes around the patient in order to maintain a sterile feel. Next, Betadine should be amply applied to the head of the penis in order to uh, sterilize the feel. Betadine is applied in a circular motion, starting from the center, moving outward. In boys who are uncircumcised, it's advisable to just gently retract the foreskin to the point where the urethromiatus is exposed. Careful attention should be paid to not retracting the skin so much to cause bleeding or injury. If, however, there is physiologic phimosis and the foreskin cannot be retracted back in order to visualize the erythromiatus, the betadine should just be applied generously around the area of catheter insertion. Next, the Foley is then going to be lubricated and then with the left hand holding the penis straight, the Foley and catheter is inserted into the urethromiate. So um, during the advancing of insertion of the catheter, um, do not force if there's any, if you feel any resistance because it might produce injury to the urethra. So especially uh, when the catheter reach the external sphincter, so uh, slowly put a minimal pressure to um, further insert the catheter. Yes. Again, in boys who are uncircumcised, and have quite tight foreskin, aiming the catheter at the six o'clock position often places it into the urethral meatus without actually visualizing the urethral meatus itself. As we discussed previously, once the catheter has reached the bladder, urine should flow freely out of the catheter. Once that the catheter has been confirmed to be in the bladder, the balloon should be inflated and for most pediatric Foley, around three to five cc of fluid is adequate. Once that has been done, the catheter can be gently pulled back in order to remove all the excess catheter from the bladder and allowing the Foley to rest securely at the bladder neck. If blood is seen in the Foley, it is important to leave the catheter in position and ask for urological assistance. So um, it is important to retract back the foreskin to prevent the complication of paraphimosis. Yeah. The first thing we... Okay, next is in female infant in which uh, in, this, in this procedure, uh, it is uses the intermittent catheter. Place the patient in the supine frog leg position with knees flexed. Wearing non-sterile gloves, place the absorbent underpad beneath the patient's buttocks with the plastic side down. Ask an assistant to hold the legs firmly in this position. Use the gauze to wash the external genitalia with soap and water. Rinse with clean water and dry with a hand towel. Dispose of the non-sterile gloves. Wash and disinfect your hands. 
Place the sterile urethral catheterization kit on a tray and open it. Disinfect your hands and put on sterile gloves. Lubricate the distal end of the catheter with sterile gel. Prepare the entire genital area by cleansing three times from the center to the periphery using an antiseptic agent. Then place the sterile fenestrated drape over the patient so that the vulva is accessible through the opening. Remove your gloves and put on another pair of sterile gloves. With your thumb and the index finger of your non-dominant hand, separate the labia, which are considered to be non-sterile. With your dominant hand, use antiseptic-soaked sterile swabs or povidone iodine swab sticks to wash the urethral meatus three times. So um, during cleansing the in between the labia minora using the antiseptic, you need to do it from anterior to posterior so that um, it will not introduce the pickle material towards the field. Place the patient in the supine and hand. Separate the labia, which are considered to be non-sterile. With your dominant hand, use antiseptic-soaked sterile swabs or povidone iodine swab sticks to wash the urethral meatus three times in the anterior to posterior direction. At many pediatric centers, lubricant gel is placed on the catheter before the procedure is performed. At some centers, clinicians also use 2% lidocaine jelly placed above the vagina prior to the catheterization. Place the catheter in a sterile container within the sterile field between the patient's legs. While holding the labia with your non-dominant hand, locate the meatus. If the mucosal covering of the vagina makes this difficult, gently pull the cephalad fold of the vaginal introitus downward. Once you have located the urethra, hold the lubricated catheter with the fingers of your dominant hand. Then slowly and gently insert the tip of the catheter into the meatus. Slowly advance the catheter into the bladder. The other end of the catheter should remain in the container. You should not encounter any resistance. If you do encounter resistance, do not force the catheter, since this may cause trauma or even perforation. If the catheter slips into the vagina, leave it there as a landmark and make a second attempt to insert a catheter into the urethral meatus. After the catheter has entered the bladder, urine should drain through it into the container. When urine flow ceases, remove the catheter or both catheters if there is also one in the vagina and submit the urine for culture and urinalysis. Okay. So here are the procedures. So you can read later. So, um. Set one to three techniques. Butcher, butcher. Ah, just butcher, yeah. Okay for, male, uh, uh, okay, for male infants, set up the equipment and then restrain uh, the infant supine in the frog leg position and then wash hands really and put on gloves and then stabilize the shelf, uh, shelf of the penis with the nine dominant hand. This hand is now considered as contaminated. And then uh, in infant which is uncircumcised, gently retract the foreskin to expose the meters, it may be difficult to locate uh, the uh, in uncircumcised newborns or young boys with a tight foreskin. And then a physiologic phimosis. Phimosis is frequently present during childhood and the foreskin should not be forced to retract. And then apply gentle pressure at the base of the penis to avoid reflex urination. Using the free hand, the other hand, for the rest of the procedure, clean the glands three times with antiseptic solution. And then uh, it, uh, the, using, the, using the antiseptic solution, uh, it begins to form the center from the meatus and uh, to the outwards. And then do it dry uh, with sterile gauze. And then drape the side for sterile, during the sterile towel across the abdomen and across the infant's leg. And then place the white end of the catheter, catheter. Into the specimen container and then lubricate the tip of the catheter to be uh, before inserted. Uh, and then move the specimen container and catheter into the sterile drape between the infant's leg. And then gently insert the catheter you through the meatus um, until the urine is seen in the, in the tube. So during the insertion, apply an upward traction of the penile shelf to prevent kinking of the urethra. 
so that the passage is now um, perpendicular, just like straight. Uh, uh, before this, it is as shape, right? And then if the meatus cannot be visualized, instead the catheter through the uh, preputial ring, which is the at the tip of the penis in a slightly inferior direction. If there is any question about the position, abandon the procedure. If a resistance is made at the external splinter, hold the catheter in place, apply a minimal pressure. A gen uh, generally spasm will relax uh, after a brief period and it allows easy passage of the catheter. If not, uh, suspect obstruction and abandon the procedure. And then do not move uh, the catheter in and out. Uh, it will cause urethral trauma. And then uh, collect specimen for culture. And if the catheter is to remain in dwelling, connect the catheter immediately to a closed sterile system for urine collection. Tape securely into the tight, uh, to the tight. And then if the catheter is to be removed, gently withdraw it when the urine flow ceases. In female infant, it is quite the same. And then follow steps one to three of any of for male infant. Uh, and then retract the labia minora. Uh, to visualize whether the urethra and then uh, to retract it, use the ghost sponge with non dominant hand or have an assistant. Retract the labia with two cotton tip applicators uh, and then using the free hand for the rest of the procedure, cleanse the area between the labia minora three times with antiseptic solution. Uh, swab it anterior to posterior direction uh, to avoid from contaminating the field with thicker material and then blow dry with sterile walls and then follow steps uh, before in the infant. So next is to visualize the meters. The most prominent structure is the vagina in choitus. The urethral meters lies immediately anterior in which the urethra is between the clitoris and also the introitus. And then uh, the meters may be obstructed by the introitus fold, fold. So gently push the fold down with a cotton tip applicator so that you can now visualize clearly the urethra. Gently insert the catheter only until urine appears in the tube. So, uh, and next, um, the same like the male infant to collect the sample and so on. So uh, it is important to have an adequate lightning, adequate lightning to visualize the urethra, especially in female. So complications of uh, urethral catheterization are rare, but uh, these are some of the complications. Uh, for example, the first one is the gross or microscopic hematoria. Next one is the creation of pulse passage from the catheter that can, if it uh, pass the urethral wall, it can cause urethral trauma. Urethral stricture uh, as a late complication. Yeah, trojanic infection also can help, uh, occur. So we need to uh, maintain a uh, proper hygiene and a septic technique during the until the uh, during the procedure. Parapimosis can also occur if uh, there is failure to retract the skin back, the pore skin back. You talk parapimosis, sir. Parapimosis is like the necrosis of the skin because reducing the blood blood flow towards the side. The the the, the. necrosis. Skin or what? For skin. Yeah, for the for skin. Hmm? Okay, huh? Okay, da. that's all for me. Okay, okay next. Kom, can you see my screen? Ah, okay, now we'll okay. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so my presentation for today is on nasogastric intubation. Ahmad Tau. Nanti lah. Ahmad Taufik. Topic today is nasogastric. Nasogastric okay. intubation. Insertion ke intubation? Insertion. Huh? Insertion. Oh, insertion. Okay, huh. okay. Okay. <clears throat> this is the outline for my presentation. And after my presentation, I'll show a video on the procedure. So, nasogastric tube insertion is indicated 
for intravenous administration of medication or fluids and also decompression of the stomach. Uh, the procedure is contraindicated if the patient has structural abnormalities, uh, trauma to the nasal, maxillary, oropharyngeal or esophageal tissue or any bleeding disorders. Uh, these are the equipments uh, required. <coughs> well. These are the equipments required for the procedure. First, you need the nasogastric tube, and then a marker to mark the length of the tube that you need uh, to insert into the patient, a water-based lubricant to, to make the insertion easier, a syringe to uh, aspirate gastric contents, pH strips to check the pH of the contents, and also tape to <coughs> secure secure the tube. Sorry, my phone. So tube sizes differ according to the age of the patient, and the gauge we use is called the French gauge. So there are different gauges for different ages of the patient. For the procedure, first of all, you need to position the patient. For infants, the patient is <coughs> positioned in the supine position. And for toddlers or young children, ideally they should be sitting up while being held by their guardian or a healthcare provider to facilitate <coughs> easy insertion of the tube. So first of all, you need to measure the tube, how much you, you need to insert. So you do this by measuring from the tip of the nose to the bottom of the earlobe to the midpoint between the xiphi sternum and umbilicus. And then you mark this point using the marker. So nose here, and then <clears throat> middle point between xiphi sternum and umbilicus. After that, you lubricate the tip of the tube and gently insert the tube into one nostril and advance in. Uh, <clears throat> you should instruct or encourage the patient to swallow to facilitate passage of the tube. Uh, depending on the age of the patient, you can uh, use pacifier or give <clears throat> uh, instruct the patient to sip uh, water. If there is coughing, wheezing, apnea, or color change, then you should withdraw the tube and reinsert once the child is stable. So all these symptoms may uh, indicate insertion into the trachea. So withdraw, and once the patient is stable, if you reinsert, try again. If resistance is met, pull back the tube and rotate slowly while readvancing. To confirm the placement of the tube, you should note the external length of the tube at the nostril first, which is the place where you uh, mark, mark the tube with the marker. So gently aspirate a small quantity of gastric fluid from the tube with a syringe and check the pH of the contents with a pH strip. The pH should be less than or equal to 4.0. And you should always ensure the external length of the tube remains unchanged. And lastly, you should <coughs> secure the tube with tape. Uh, complications from nasogastric tube insertion include trauma to surrounding tissues when inserting the tube, pneumothorax in case of uh, insertion into the trachea, and spontaneous passage through the pylorus, causing feeding intolerance, abdominal pain, poor absorption of medications, and also diarrhea. Uh, so now, video. <coughs> okay. okay. Let's get some hand sanitizer on. You ready for a new tube? Shall we do a new tube? Okay. Oh, good. That's a great job. Thank you. All 
right now. Let's measure and see how long we've been doing. Okay. It's okay. You're suspicious, aren't you? So she's measuring the tube from the nose to the ear to the midpoint between Zephy sternum and umbilicus. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, order that. Video uh. on saya tak jumpa yang oral gastric. Jumpa naso je. Ya? Hmm. Uh -huh. Last school dapat oral bubuh, oral naso. Last school dia dapat oral bubuh, oral dengan naso gastric. Because dia betul dia betul dia calculation is different eh. How how what how you oral gastric? How you calculate where from where to where? Hmm. Mm, not sure. Ah, macam mana you you oral gastric, the naso gastric, the oral, oral naso ni artinya ialah dia naso gastric satu, tu oral gastric satu. Hmm? Certain patient we use oral gastric. Certain patient we use naso gastric. Yeah, depend to the patient. Yeah, and then many time we sometimes we use oral then naso. Yeah, actually in in, in baby, yeah? in infant, big children we offer naso. Yeah? But in big infant, we small, but in small in baby because they not teeth, yeah. You can, you can then you when you put the naso, it block the respiration. Wow. Hmm? If you see unwell child, you put the naso, it block the respiration. We prefer oral gastric, yeah? oral gastric than naso gastric. 
And furthermore, dia tak ada gigi. Hmm? So you miss that one. Eh? Okay? Because the technique is nearly the same. Bila you put nasogastric, how you know it's not inside the lung? Complication nasogastric apa? Uh, pneumothorax. Pneumothorax. Pneumothorax, the complication. Buka balik, tengok. The most important complication is that you put nasogastric is you worry that your what the tube enter the lung. The, yeah. How you know it's not in the lung? What do you do? Aspirate the aspirate the to uh, chest X-ray. Uh, before chest X-ray. Just as you do when you're not sure. You aspirate, you put the pH paper. Satu. Nombor dua, you flush the air. And you ask it where the sound is. Yeah? Is it inside the gastric or inside the lung? lung? Because you can see, you, you can... Eh, you can 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 you you flush is set, you the sound you heard is, is funny is the you chest of the in the stomach then you worry about that but the, the, the technique usually is because sometimes pH paper is not always around it's not easy to get pH paper now you do experience people with flush hmm? You flush with air and you listen to the the abdomen or the chest. See the sound is. The second is pH paper. You can get pH paper. But if you're not sure still, then you do the chest yes, x-ray. So your oral gastric is not eh? Because nasal gastric is another is one. The other one is the oral gastric. You calculate from here, set the knee until the Pina, pina here, oh, eh? down here. Hmm? Then go down to the uh, dekat, uh, to, uh, low end of the there. There's a difference you calculate for orogastric. Yeah? And, and I said to you, infirm, you prefer orogastric rather than orogastric. Okay, next presenter. That's me. Siapa? Uh, Faiz. Give a topic. My topic, height, weight and head circumference. Very uh, simple. So height, weight and circumference, pretty simple stuff. There's no, not really any complications, contraindications. All you need to know is that uh, height, weight, and head circumference are usually done for when you have a health visit or health review of your child. So I'll start with length because usually you have height, but in children less than two years old or they're unable to stand, you use the recumbent length, ideally with an infantometer right here. You can see on the diagram. So what you do is that this infantometer, you position, you need two people. One person take the head of the infant and you put it against the wall of the infantometer. And then the second person, what you'll do is they try to press the knees so they can stretch the legs. They straighten the legs and then use the infantometer, push it against the feet of the child and then you record the length. I'll just show you a video right here. Measuring length ideally should be completed. Can you guys hear it? By two healthcare providers. Yes. To measure length, lay the infant face up on an infantometer. 
The first healthcare provider correctly positions the newborn's head against the head plate and gently holds the head in this position. The second healthcare provider gently presses the infant's knees to straighten the legs. Then he or she should press the bottom of the foot onto the foot plate so that there is no gap between the foot and the foot plate. Record the length of the infant by reading the measurement on the infantometer. If an infantometer is not available, a non-stretchable measuring tape can be used. Positioning the infant's head against a wall or other vertical flat surface is the best way to mark the head position. The infant's legs are then extended as before. The heel position is marked, and the distance from the wall to the infant's heel is measured with a tape. So yeah, you can see that you don't really need other ways to do it besides an infantometer. Measuring length. And so that's in children who are less than two years old or cannot stand. So if it's more than two years old, usually they can stand. You have the child remove the shoes pretty, pretty much the same way as adults. Like they stand up and then you use the stadiometer to check the height and make sure that the person who's being recorded, the person who's being recorded, make sure they face in front to the point where there is, or you can see a horizontal line from the ear canal to the lower border of eye socket, an imaginary line basically. And you record that to the nearest 0 0.1 centimeters. And if you want an accurate measurement, you can also repeat the measurement three times and get the average measurement of that. So yeah, these are for children more than two years old. Next, go into weight. So for children less than, less than two years old, the infants, usually uh, you have to undress them naked. You can see the diagram, the infant still has the diaper on, but yeah, ideally you need them to remove the diaper. So what you do is that once you've asked, instructed the parent to undress the infant, then you put the blanket on the weighing scale. In infants, you use a weighing scale, you place them, and then you make sure the child has no other support. Make sure the legs or hands are kind of the major. Just make sure they're floating on top of the scale. And for children above two years of age, again, like the height is pretty much the same as adolescents, adults, you use the scale. And yeah, you can remove. Usually, I'm not sure if you're supposed to remove the clothes or not, but I don't think so. The WHO says you remove as much as clothing as necessary. And this is a video example for the week. The next step is to measure the child's body weight. For providing these, the baby should be undressed. For measurement, we use electronic scales. We put the blanket on the scale and turn on. We are waiting for reset for the scale, then we can start to measure. Put the child in the middle of the scale pen. Make sure that the hands and legs do not touch the table. The mother does not support the child. We wait until the electronic scoreboard stops flashing and fits the results. Weight is 4 kilograms, 437 grams. Mother can wear a baby with diaper and blouse. We we'll record the results. Yeah, pretty much that. Okay, and when you record the weight, when you want to compare the weight and the height to the growth chart, you have to make sure uh, you know which growth chart to use. You can see the left and right. Uh, you'll notice that number one, that they are gender, I mean, sex specific. 
One is for males, one is for females. And you also have variations in the scale they provide. Like on the left, you can see it's for children from birth to 24 months. Yeah, birth to 24 months. And on the right, you can see it's for females, but the age range is for 2 to 20 years old. This is a CDC graph in WHO. It's 2 to 5 years. And now finally, to head circumference, usually you use a measuring tape. Make sure the measuring tape cannot be stretched, of course. And you measure it by wrapping the tape around the head of the infant. Make sure at the frontal side, the tape is usually above the eyebrow. And then at the back side, you use the most prominent part of the back to get the widest head circumference. Repositioning the tape, usually you can tighten or yeah, slightly tighten it to get a, a more accurate reading. Measure it three times, record to the nearest 0 0.1 centimeters. And here is the video. Okay. All right. First, start with a measuring tape that cannot be stretched. Next, securely wrap the tape around the widest possible circumference of the head. That's usually one to two finger widths above the eyebrow on the forehead. And then across the most prominent part of the back of the head, as you can see here. We recommend that you reposition the tape and repeat the measurements three times. Record the largest measurement to the nearest 0 0.1 centimeters. Yeah, pretty simple, pretty simple stuff. Yeah. And notice yeah. many of you probably saw what an example that about what. Can. Sorry, pretty simple. But uh, many of you when we ask to do an example, that about what. Oh yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh, what, what, what's the what's the usual mistake? Mistake uh, position, salah. Oh, hmm? tak tahu letak position. You don't know you you had you many of you don't know that it had to be just above, above the eyebrow here and and the main mistake at the back, hmm? okay. at the hospital part. Okay. You understand where to put at the back there? Tung gambar semua tadi. Yeah, black gambar gambar backward backward ah. Eh? See, is there at the hospital the highest? Where the highest prominent uh, bone at yeah, hospital, that's where you put the, the yep. uh, tip there, and then you 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 measure, and you see the technique is strong. The the lower the, because is you put at the back here, and you measure up here, hmm? not measure at the back up here, wrong. Terbalik. Many of you measure dekat sini, dekat sini, yeah. You have to put here and measure here. Bukan kat sini, bukan kat sini. Eh, measurement is at here. Dia semula gambar uh, video tadi. Hmm. First, start with a measuring tape that cannot be stretched. Next, securely wrap the tape around the widest possible circumference of the head. That's usually one to two finger widths above the eyebrow on the forehead and then across the most prominent part of the back of the head, as you can see here. We recommend that you reposition the tape and repeat the measurements three times. You see, you can see me. Record the largest measurement to the nearest okay. 0 0.1 centimeters. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, just want to show the chart. Usually it's just up to 24 months. And that's all. Yeah, presenter. Can you guys see the screen? I'm Bob. Uh, can okay. you guys see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay, so uh, my name is uh, Nur Aina Izati Binti Abdul Aziz, and my topic for today is uh, Central Venus Line Insertion. 
Okay, so next. Okay, so for introduction, um, central venous line, it is defined as the placement of devices such as catheters, uh, and the catheter is inserted into a central venous grade vessel to allow access to the bloodstream. And the placement sites include uh, the internal jugular vein, the femoral vein, and the subclavian vein. And the catheters uh, are advanced until uh, the terminal lumen resides uh, either in the inferior vena cava, superior vena cava, or in the right atrium. And usually, uh, the subclavian route has been preferred uh, route for many years and afford the, affords the patient the greatest mobility. Huh? Uh, Aina, Nur Aina Izati. Yeah, okay. 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 So, okay. Uh, usually, the subclavian route has been preferred uh, before uh, because the patient will have greatest mobility. However, uh, in infant, it can be hard to access the uh, subclavian and the internal jugular vein uh, because usually they have short necks. So, uh, we usually do the femoral vein uh, central line insertion in pediatrics. Okay, so for indications, uh, the first one is uh, if there is in a, inadequate IV peripheral venous access, such as uh, in patient with burns or previous vein injuries. And in this situation, a central venous line may be preferred technique to gain uh, vascular access. And the second one is uh, administration of peripherally incompatible infusion, um, such as uh, when the infusion can cause uh, phlebitis or extravasation of fluid. Uh, and we need to consider using central venous access uh, when using uh, vasoactive medications such as uh, vasopressor and also cause, uh, when um, administering caustic fluids such as uh, chemotherapy or high uh, concentration fluid. And the third one is uh, hemodynamic uh, monitoring. Um, once we place a central venous line, it can be used to measure the patient's uh, central venous pressure. And this is important uh, and helpful if we are trying to decide whether the patients need more uh, volume resuscitation or not. And the fourth one is, uh, it is also indicated for extracorporeal therapies, which means uh, a therapy, um, a treatment modality that promotes the removal of endogenous or exogenous poison, and also uh, when the therapy is used to replace uh, vital organs such as in uh, hemodialysis. And the fifth one is it is indicated in uh, venous intervention as well as placement of other medical devices such as uh, when we need to place pacemakers and also uh, pulmonary artery catheters. Okay, so for contraindication, the absolute contraindication uh, we cannot do the procedure if there is any infection at the insertion site and also if there's any inflammation to the vein, which is uh, thrombophlebitis. And the relative uh, contraindications include uh, distorted local anatomy, uh, such as uh, if there is any vascular injury, prior surgery, or previous irradiation to the insertion site, and also presence of anticoagulate anticoagulation or bleeding disorder, uh, which makes the patient more prone to bleed. Uh, and then if there's any current or possible thrombolysis therapy, uh, uncooperative patient, and also lack of consent in non-emergency uh, settings. Okay, so for the equipment, uh, usually uh, we use the central line kits and uh, in the central line uh, in the central line kits, they include a uh, syringe and needle for local anesthetic, a uh, small vial of 1% lidocaine for uh, as a local anesthetic, and also syringe and uh, introduction needle, scalpel, uh, guide wire, tissue dilator, sterile dressing, uh, suture and needle, and also um, <coughs> central line catheter, uh, which there are several types, including triple lumen, uh, dual lumen, and also a uh, large bore single lumen. And additional items for the um, for the doctor who's going to perform uh, the procedure include sterile gown and cap, sterile gloves, uh, sterile gauze, sterile saline, uh, face mask, and also a uh, sterile cleansing solution. And usually, uh, this procedure is done with uh, the guidance of ultrasound. So the operator should also um, prepare uh, sterile ultrasound gel and also sterile ultrasound probe as the part of setup. 
Okay, so for uh, central venous approaches, uh, in general, like I've mentioned before, there are three types, uh, and this include internal jugular vein, subclavian vein, and also femoral vein. And selection of the most uh, appropriate site for central venous cannulation is based upon the expertise and skill of the operator. Uh, also, patient anatomy, if there is any venous occlusion or lymph edema, uh, the risk associated with uh, placement, and also the access needs uh, for the patient. So we'll go through a bit uh, one by one. Okay, so the first one is uh, internal jugular approach. Uh, for positioning of the patient, uh, the right side is preferred because uh, it affords a straighter path to superior vena cava. And also we need to place the patient in a uh, trend Dillenberg position, like in the picture besides, uh, whereby the body is laid supine or flat on the back on a 15 to 30 degree incline with the feet uh, elevated above the head. And usually we put patient in trend Dillenberg position so that uh, to distend the internal jugular vein and to prevent air embolism. And we turn the head of the patient to the side and we, uh, the operator should stand at the head of the bed. And for the needle placement, uh, for landmarking, we need to palpate the carotid arterial pass uh, using three fingers to appreciate the course of the artery. And uh, internal jugular vein lies uh, usually just lateral to the artery. So we insert uh, procedural needles into the apical area uh, or the superior angle of the anterior cervical triangle which is the apex, uh, which you can see in the picture, uh, just lateral to the carotid pulse uh, at a 30 to 40 degree angle into the skin and we aim toward the ipsilateral nipple. And for um, internal jugular approach, uh, we usually have three, uh, three approaches whereby it can either be anterior, central or posterior. And these approaches refer to the entry point whether we insert uh, the needle in front uh, at the bifurcation of or behind the sternocleidomastoid uh, muscle. And usually central approach is preferred whereby we insert it uh, at the apex of the sternocleidomastoid uh, muscle because uh, it is uh, it decreases the chance of pleural and also carotid artery puncture. Okay, uh, the next one is subclavian approach. Um, for positioning, uh, the right side is also preferred because uh, the right pleural apex is lower than the left. So uh, it has lower risk uh, for pneumothorax. And we also put the patient in trend the Lambert position and we keep the patient's arm adducted and head neutral. And the operator should stand at the side of the bed. Uh, and for landmarking, uh, we place uh, the tip of uh, the finger on the sternal notch, like in the picture, and uh, the thumb at the midpoint of the clavicle, uh, of the clavicle. And needle placement is at the junction of the medial and middle third of the clavicle. And insertion should be uh, one cm inferior to the clavicle to allow the needle to pass under the clavicle. And usually uh, the needle should be parallel to the skin and we aim towards the sternal notch. And the last one is for femoral vein. Uh, for positioning, we place the patient in supine or in slight reverse trend Lambert position, and uh, we comfortably abduct and externally rotate the leg. We can also uh, put uh, a towel under the hips to elevate the pelvis uh, to cause slight stretching of the vein uh, for easier access. For needle placement, uh, we need to palpate the artery first. So we gently palpate the femoral arterial below the inguinal ligament uh, pulse using two or three fingers. And uh, the femoral vein, uh, it lies medial to the artery. Uh, so we insert procedural needles, two to four cm inferior to the inguinal ligament, uh, one cm medial to the femoral artery where the vein is located at, a, at an angle of 45 to 60 degree into the skin and we aim towards the umbilicus. Okay, so for uh, procedure and technique, um, it is important to remember that the steps that uh, we use to place the catheters in the various sites are the same, only the anatomy and the landmarking is different. So we usually, uh, we basically use the Saldinger technique and usually we use alongside ultrasound guide uh, to confirm the placement uh, inside the correct vessel. Okay, so uh, 
and we can summarize the technique uh, as the following, whereby uh, we use the introducing needle to locate the vein. And usually we also use bedside ultrasound to identify the target vein when we need to uh, place the needle. And then we insert guide wire uh, through the needle and then we remove the needle. Uh, and then we make a small incision uh, for the skin to insert a dilator. Uh, we need the dilator to insert the catheter after. And then uh, we insert the catheter and remove the guide wire. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, in the next video for further understanding. Uh, okay. Uh, before the procedure, uh, we need to use dry technique whereby we uh, uh, use dry technique and also anesthesia for the patient. Okay, as you can see, uh, when uh, the operator insert the uh, introducer needle, uh, we should get venous blood flowing rapidly back into the syringe. And we need to advance the needle uh, further into the vein to ensure that the entire lumen of the needle uh, is in the vein. And usually we do this, uh, if possible, under ultrasound guide uh, uh, to avoid a puncture of the artery. Okay, for uh, insertion of the guide wire, uh, we should uh, the guide wire should advance smoothly with little resistance, and we should never force uh, the wire to be inserted. Uh, usually, if we require force, uh, the wire is in the wrong spot, and if we continue the attempt, it will only make the process harder, and it can result it can result uh, with a laceration of the vessel. Okay, for uh, when you, uh, after we insert the wire, uh, we need to do a skin incision to insert the dilator. And the dilator is to dilate the path uh, to enable easy passage of the multilumen catheter into the vein. And uh, when, we, when we're in, uh, doing skin incision and also inserting the uh, dilator, we should never let go of the wire because um, a guide wire can float uh, all the way into central vein and it can disappear. And this can be a uh, 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 severe complication. Uh, for flushing, uh, for flushing the lumen of the catheter, uh, we need to flush it uh, to make sure it is free of air and ready to use.
uh, and we flushed the lumen with a sterile saline. Uh, okay, so I think that's it for the video. Um, uh, okay, so this is the uh, procedure in details, uh, which you can go through later. Uh, or do I need to read it, doctor? Mm -hmm. doctor? We, we complicate that. Uh, I think you can go through it later. Basically, it's just a summarization of the video. Okay, so for, um, okay, so for comparison, of the site. Um, okay, uh, the first one is internal jugular vein. Uh, usually, uh, my position is rare because it has a fairly uh, predictable course and it runs just lateral to the carotid artery. And they uh, it has less risk of pneumothorax compared to subclavian uh, insertion. And the bleeding can be recognized and controlled because uh, if there is any bleeding, we can apply direct pressure to the bleeding uh, to stop it. And for disadvantages, uh, there's still risk of uh, carotid artery puncture and also pneumothorax. And for subclavian vein, it is most comfortable in conscious patient because the patient does not need to turn their head uh, like for uh, IJV insertion. Uh, however, it has highest chance of pneumothorax and the chance is increased uh, on the left side because the apical pleura is higher and it is closer to the needle insertion path and they have highest risk of bleeding. And uh, if there is bleeding, we cannot apply pressure because the vein uh, is deep to the clavicle. And the last one is for uh, femoral vein. Uh, the advantages is uh, it is easy to find, no pneumothorax. And also if there is puncture, we can uh, apply direct pressure to it. However, it is not good for ambulatory patient and it has highest risk of infection and also risk of uh, deep vein thrombosis. Uh, last one for complication. Uh, general complications uh, of central line include air embolism, intravenous thrombus formation, uh, catheter embolism, local hematoma, arterial puncture, uh, local cellulitis, catheter infection, and intravascular loss of uh, guide wire. And for internal jugular and subclavian sites, uh, can cause pneumothorax, hemothorax, uh, chylothorax, phrenic nerve, and brachial plexus injury, and also cerebral infarct uh, if there is any carotid artery cannulation. And the last one is for femoral vein. Uh, it has fewer complications, but it includes uh, bladder perforation, bowel perforation, uh, and increased risk of uh, local and central line infection. Uh, I think that is all from me. Okay. okay. The procedure is very complicated. I think you know in, if you know if you know something about it, it's good enough. Lah. Hmm? Quite a complicated procedure. It's one of the way where we get the another center line, important line for especially patient with uh, unstable patient and patient who need prolonged treatment. Eh? Any other question? Any presenter? One more. Okay. Alisa. Oh, okay. Alisa Nabila. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So my name is Alisa Nabila binti Saharuddin. So now I will continue presenting about the electrocardiogram also known as ECG or EKG. 
So uh, ECT is actually a quick, simple and painless procedure that it works to amplify the electrical impulse of the heart. And then it shows the information on straight of the, of the graph paper to be interpreted at the end of the procedure. So it can provide us information regarding the rate and rhythm of the heart, size of the chambers of the heart and also the nerve conduction of the heart. So how this ECG uh, detect the electrical impulse is by the electrode that we put on the patient surface or the surface patient, patient surface or the work patient surface body and then uh, this uh, electrode it gives us a uh, very uh, 12 characteristic, characteristic views of the heart uh, six views from the limb lead uh, like uh, the picture in the blue color one and six views from the chest lead from v1 to v6 and then uh, as i mentioned it gives us different uh, characteristic views of the heart so for lead one to vl it will give us uh, information regarding left lateral surface of the heart uh, lead 3 VF, inferior surface of heart, VR uh, for right atrium. And then for the chest lead, uh, V1, V2, it gives us information regarding the right ventricle. V3, V4, regarding the septum and the anterior wall of the left ventricle. V5, V6, uh, regarding the anterior and lateral wall of the left ventricle. So it is indicated if the patient has known cardiac history or disease, such as ischemic heart disease, myocardial infarction, cardiac dysrhythmia, valvular heart disease, implanted defibrillator or pacemaker, Electrolyte abnormality that can disrupt the heart activity such as hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, non cardiac disease such as pulmonary embolism, hypothermia, shock, drowning, and drug effects such as digoxin toxicity. So, for contraindication, it actually has no absolute contraindication, but we have to take precautions if the patient has allergic to the adhesive, adhesive used for the electrodes. And if patient refuses to do ECG, we need to convince them that this uh, procedure is, uh, is painless and no harm. So, uh, for the state of their uh, diagnosis and management. And then for preparation, uh, firstly, we have to gain consent from the guardian or the parents and then assure the patient that there is no danger and pain involved because we want the patient to be clinically stable so that it, uh, it, will, not, it will not disrupt the ECG result. And then uh, should not use any cream, lotion, powder or baby oil during the day of the test. Remove clothing above the waist. Don't need a closed gown with opening to the front like in the picture I've, I've provided. Uh, make patient comfortable lying down on the exam table, expose the arm and legs, and clean the exposed skin with alcohol for proper electrode admission. And then for the uh, electrode, we have a specific location on uh, where we have to place it. So for uh, right and left uh, upper leg, we can put it uh, at the proximal to the wrist or near the uh, joint, eh, near the shoulder uh, where there is little muscle movement uh, to avoid any signal disturbance. And then for lower limb, uh, we can put it at the proximal to ankle or also uh, near the uh, hip uh, due to the same reason as well. And then for the chest uh, lead, uh, we have V1 and V6. V1 and V2, we put it at the core intercostal space, uh, one at the right of the sternum and the other to the left of the sternum. And then V3, we put it directly between the V2 and V4. V4 at the fifth intercostal space uh, at the left mid clavicular line. V5 at uh, the level of uh, V4, but at the left anterior axillary line. And V6 at the level of V5 at the left mid axillary line. And for pediatric, uh, we can put extra V3R or V4R uh, in the same position, uh, uh, but, at, but on the right side. Because but it is only really that. It... Sorry? Why you put V4R? Uh, because uh, it is believed that in infant and toddler they have right ventricle dominance. Uh, it means the right ventricle is quite thicker than the left ventricle because of the effect of the uh, ductus arteriosus during fetal circulation. So we might want to put it, uh, especially when we suspect any right ventricle uh, condition. <laughs> So now we are going to skip preparation. Just feeling basic and doing foliation on those spots. Now 
now we're just going to take the ISO wipes and we're going to wipe over the areas that we exfoliated. So now we are ready to place the electrodes on to our rose. Yeah, we've tried them. Yeah, we've tried them before. I'm just going to feel a little bit again. The electrodes are placed on the body facing down, just feeling yeah. our rose's spaces. So on the child, we place one of the electrodes over to the right side of the chest. And then one comes under your underarm. Yeah, and then the other one comes under your underarm. One more. And electrodes on the wrist will then be placed facing down. And one on the other one. Good job, you could help us. And ankles facing oh, up. It's a bit chilly in this room. The stickers are cold. I didn't want to do it. Come on, look at you. You're going to be like a movie star now. Now we are going to attach the wires onto the electrodes. Got the numbers on them? Okay, so let's go. So we one. just attach them to the edge of the electrode, making sure the clip doesn't go too far up onto the electrode. Just try to keep the wires straight without too many kinks in them. So now we have all the electrodes on. We're going to instruct the patient to lay nice and still, no talking or moving for a moment. And we just cover her up to maintain her dignity. When she's laying nice and still, we have a nice clear trace, nice steady heartbeat. We're going to start. Now we've got the trace, we unclip the wires from the electrodes, pull the electrode off, stick them to the glove on the back of the hand. Okay, still for what this one? Hmm. Okay. But in 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 infant you still do.
and sometimes we give chloral hydride eh, to sedate the child, especially less than two years or three years old, eh? because it's not easy to do in two or three years old child not cooperative. Eh? Okay, any anything else? Finish. Okay. Okay. Uh, you mind your next group, eh? Please prepare the video. Eh? So two of you didn't have any proper video, eh? Okay. Anything else? Okay, the objective of this listening process is to recognize, eh? and then we may be asked a few a few MCQ about the complication, eh? or inside the the picture, eh? we ask you the procedure, we can ask the complication, eh? understand? So it's, it's part of your name, but for because you're going to practice, you're going to learn more and practice and doing it when you are houseman, then it become more clear to you. But you have to know the basic, uh, basic uh, understanding and the basic theory of it. So when you when when you go to your uh, internship later on, at least when people mention all this, you have some ideas what is what it is. Eh? Okay, any questions? You think the presenting is for me or for you all? Eh? Uh, for you all, eh? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Oh, okay. Um, doctor? Ma? Um, um, that's right. Last week, kan, some of us didn't show the video because they forgot. Uh, yes, because they do uh, so, do we need to send it to you or? You are, do you have video with you now? No. Uh, I do. Hmm? Uh, for endotracheal intubation. Ah, ada? Ah, ada. Ah, I can show to us. Ensure you have all the equipments ready for intubation. You would need another person to help you for providing the supplies, for assessing the heart rate and for informing the oxygen saturation. Ensure strict asepsis during the procedure. Stand at the head end of the baby. Hold the laryngoscope in your left hand. Choose an appropriate size blade, size 0, for preterms and size 00 for very preterms. Introduce the laryngoscope blade, pushing the tongue away. Visualize the glottic opening. Clear the secretions as required. Identify the vocal cords and introduce gently the endotracheal tube. Do not force the endotracheal tube in position. If the baby takes a gasp, wait and then reintroduce the tube. Remember, there is no role for providing free flow oxygen during the procedure. Rise in heart rate is the first parameter of improvement. Further, bilateral chest expansion, equal air entry on both sides of the chest, Absence of abdominal distension, improvement in color, improvement in tone confirms that the endotracheal tube is in appropriate position. Endotracheal tube must be fixed securely. Cut the endotracheal tube 4 cm, extending beyond the lips to decrease the dead space. Thank you. Okay, any more? Uh, doctor, I also want to share about the CPR. CPR, okay. Uh.
Okay, so we're gonna, we're, this is child CPR. We're gonna check for danger like before. Um, it's most important that you don't go rushing in and get yourself hurt. And it must be safe for you, the casualty, the casualty's family, bystanders and um, emergency services. Who are you gonna call to help you? So this is a child, he's under eight, but over one. We check for breathing like before, tip his head back, hold the bony part of his chin, balance yourself on your elbow, look, listen and feel for 10 seconds, see his chest rising, see his belly rising, feel him breathing on your cheek, hear him breathing in your ear. So we've not got that in this case, so we're gonna do um, five rescue breaths first. The likelihood is it's, been, it's um, airway and lungs, not heart related, so we're gonna reoxygenate his blood. So we're gonna tip his head back, pinch his nose, cover his mouth with mine, looking down the length of his chest, I'm gonna give him five breaths. As soon as I see the movement in his chest, I'm gonna stop blowing. Otherwise, I can overinflate his lungs. So now to do compressions on a child, I can use the heel of my hand or I can use the bar where my fingers join. Um, I get my, my shoulders above the center of his chest, the heel of my hand on the, cent uh, um, on the center of his chest and my fingers level with his armpit like before and 30 compressions looking for that perfusion. So after 30 compressions, the head tilt, chin lift again, pinch his nose and two breaths this time. And then carry on until qualified help arrives. Simple. If you arrive on the scene, check the scene for safety. Check the infant for consciousness. Gently tap the shoulder or flick the bottom of the hill and shout. Baby, baby, are you okay? Are you okay? No response. Call 911 immediately. Call 911. If the infant is lying on their stomach, turn them on to their back. They should be lying on a hard, flat surface. Check for breathing and signs of life. Watch their chest for any normal movement. Look for signs of life and breathing for no more than 10 seconds. No breathing or signs of life, begin CPR. Position two or three fingers on the center of the infant's breastbone just below the nipple line. Compress the chest one and a half inches in depth 30 times. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. After giving compressions, give breaths. Tilt the infant's head back slightly, using one hand on the forehead and lifting up on the infant's chin with two fingers with the other hand. Cover both the infant's nose and mouth with your mouth. Give two small, slow breaths, watching for the infant's chest to rise. Continue with 30 compressions, two breaths. Continue CPR until you see signs of life, another rescuer takes over, or help arrives. Okay, are you looking? I'm doing a research for doctor. Ah, go ahead. MDI. Yeah. Ah, just start now. Inhalers with spacers using a mask. An inhaler is the most common way to take asthma medicine. In order to get the medicine all the way to the lungs, you need to use a spacer. 
If you don't use a spacer, only about one third of the medicine gets to the lungs. The rest just sits in your mouth, throat, or stomach. Now we will demonstrate how to properly use an inhaler with a spacer. Younger children will use a spacer with a mask. Step one, prime the inhaler before use according to the manufacturer's instructions. Step two, stand or sit up straight. Step three, take off cap and shake the inhaler. Step four, insert the inhaler into the end of the spacer. Use of spacer and holding chamber with the inhaler is the best way. It helps the medicine reach the lungs where it is needed. Step five, breathe out all the way. Step six, place mask firmly on face covering nose and mouth. Press down on the inhaler and breathe in and out slowly six times. Step seven, shake the inhaler before taking each puff. If more than one puff is ordered, allow 30 seconds to one minute between each puff. Step eight, wipe face after using any inhaled steroid medicine. You should clean your spacer once a week. Pull the pieces apart and soak them in warm, soapy water for 15 minutes. Rinse the pieces with clean water and allow them to air dry before putting them back together. Never wipe the inside of the spacer. There's a special lining that helps the medicine get to the lungs. If you have any questions, please ask your health care provider. What? To what learn more, visit choa.org forward slash asthma. Go back to the school. School, school. Step one, step two, though. Hmm. Take off cap and shake the inhaler. Children will use a spacer with a mask. Step one, prime the inhaler before use according to the manufacturer's instructions. Step two, stand or sit up straight. Step three, take off cap and shake the inhaler. Step four, insert the inhaler into the end of the spacer. Use of spacer and holding chamber with the inhaler is the best way. It helps the medicine reach the lungs where it is needed. Step five, breathe out all the way. Step six, place mask firmly on face covering nose and mouth. Press down on the inhaler and breathe in and out slowly six times. Step seven, shake the inhaler before taking each puff. If more than one puff is ordered, allow 30 seconds to one minute between each puff. Step eight, Wipe face after using any inhaled steroid medicine. You should clean your spacer once a week. Pull the pieces apart and soak them in warm. Ada lagi? Lagi satu nebulizer, doktor. Nebulizer. Delivery of medication via nebulizers by Craig Smallwood. Before we proceed, we'll also want to ensure that the patient is in the correct position. I'm gonna put the head of the bed to approximately 30 to 45 degrees. An important performance note about jet nebulizers is that they should be oriented approximately vertically to work effectively. Tilting the device too far, perhaps 20 to 30 degrees on any angle, in any direction, can cause the medication to move away from the jet gas port inside the device and render the treatment ineffective. If you notice a treatment you are administering is taking a long period of time, or there doesn't appear to be an appropriate volume of aerosol generated, you may want to check the nebulizer to ensure proper vertical orientation. Next, I'm going to connect the nebulizer to our gas source using oxygen tubing. It should be noted that in order to adequately power jet nebulizers, a specific gas flow is required for this device. The manufacturer in this case recommends nine liters per minute. However, it doesn't necessarily matter what type of gas. It could be 100% O2, air, heliox, etc. You'll need to exercise good clinical judgment to determine the appropriate gas for your treatment. Often, patients receive 100% oxygen if there are no contraindications, simply because this is the most readily available compressed gas in most institutions. But importantly, make sure that the gas flow is not running when you connect it. You should wait until the setup is complete and the device is adequately affixed to the child before you start the gas flow. 
This will minimize the amount of wasted drug and maximize the received dose. Next, I have our drug. I've removed the cap, and I'm going to take our medication, which is in a liquid suspension, and place it inside the device. We're going to replace the cap, patch the interface, affix the oxygen tubing to the bottom portion of the nebulizer, and place the mask on our patient. I'm going to turn the oxygen flow rate onto 9 liters per minute as per recommendations by the manufacturer. This treatment should last anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. Okay. Ada lagi? Habis? Ah, okay, sudah. Okay. Okay. Ada apa lagi? Okay, finish. Okay. Maka nanti saya hantar terus pada Farah ni. Okay. Baik sangat ni sebut. Okay, ha. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you.